who is the greatest person that history has forgotten. World War II edition. Aristides de Sousa Mendes, the Portuguese diplomat who saved 30,000 people from the Nazis during WWII. It's a well-known fact Oscar Schindler saved 1,200 Jews from the Nazi regime thanks to Steven Spielberg's movie Schindler's List. But very few people are aware of the greatest act of rescue by an individual during the Second World War. At the time of the German invasion of France, Aristides, a devout Christian of aristocratic origins with 14 children, was the Portuguese consul to Bordeaux. The Nazi advance through the country had people on the run. Jews, spies, occupied government officials, all were trying to find a way out, and Portugal, an officially neutral country during WWII, was considered by many as the last way out of Europe. However, to appease the Third Reich, Antonio de Oliveira Salazar, the Portuguese dictator at the time, issued Circular 14, a document decreeing that no Jews and other Europeans expelled from their countries would be issued visas. Aristides was torn as he viewed the order as going against the constitutional principles of his country. But people still gathered outside the consulate in Bordeaux, desperate. It was then Sousa Mendes met Rabbi Chaim Kruger, a Polish refugee who told the Portuguese diplomat he would not accept his own visa until all the other refugees waiting got this as well. He took to his bed in a two-day crisis of conscience. After which he rose, his mind made up. The consulate staff made a note of his statement, I cannot allow all you people to die. Many of you are Jews, and our constitution clearly states that neither the religion nor the political beliefs of foreigners can be used as a pretext for refusing to allow them to stay in Portugal. I've decided to be faithful to that principle, but I shan't resign for all that. The only way I can respect my faith as a Christian is to act in accordance with the dictates of my conscience. On June 16th. 1940, assisted by his wife, children and Kruger, Sousa men set up a round-the-clock visa issuing line which ended up creating 30,000 visas 12,000 of those helped Jews escape from the Nazis' shadow. Salvador Dali, Hollywood actor Robert Montgomery and the entire Belgian cabinet, among 18,000 others, also received visas. After two days, Sousa Mendes continued his heroic work at the border towns of Bayonne and Hende. He was then ordered back to Portugal on July 8, where Salazar, angry at his defiance, declared him mentally unfit. Salsa Mendes said, even if I'm dismissed, I can only act as a Christian as my conscience tells me. He was stripped of his diplomatic status, his pension and his right to practice law, his original profession. No one, the state ordered, was to reach out to him or his family. He was declared persona non grata in his own country, leaving him and his family as domiciled exiles. He couldn't find a job and his family was shunned and condemned to poverty. It got to the point where he was forced to use his house's doors as firewood to keep his family warm during the winter. According to Helen Kaufman who runs the AJPN, L'Association Anonymes, Just Set Per Seca Taster and La Period Nazi, a charity that created a database of individuals who helped those persecuted by the Nazis, Salsa Men's actions were pivotal to the reconstruction of Europe after the war. It's not just the amount of people he saved, but who many of them were. The governments of Belgium and Poland, the royal families of Luxembourg and Austria, along with political activists from throughout the continent. These were to be responsible for rebuilding the framework of Europe when hostilities ended. Later in his life, Salsa Men said I could not have acted otherwise, and I therefore accept all that has befallen me with love. He died in 1954, in absolute poverty in a Franciscan monastery. Twelve years later he was recognized by Israel's Yad Vashem in 1966, righteous among the nations. In 1987 the Portuguese government restored his diplomatic status and dismissed all charges against him. Many of the second generation Jew survivors were not aware of the fact that their parents were able to leave Europe only due to visas that Sousa Mendes issued or the personally devastating consequences of his heroic actions. It's time more people knew of him and what he did. Meet Jew and Pugil Garsha. Just your ordinary World War II spy who faked his death and royally fucked over Nazis. Flashback to 1939, Britain has just declared war on Germany and Garsha is determined to help the efforts as a spy. With a stunning lack of relevant credentials and equally lacking connections, he is turned down. However, when I say Garsha was determined, I mean he is really really determined. He meets with Nazi officers, 
posing as a Spanish official wanting to spy on Britain. And they take him up on the offer, asking him to move to London. But Garsha had his own idea and instead packs up his bags for Lisbon. Nonetheless, he began feeding the Germans information, most of it complete bullshit, but littered with enough facts to foster their trust. Oh and that's not to mention he made up an entirely imaginary network of subagents. He'd write back to Germany with incredibly detailed stories that he had received from 27 imaginary spies 27 spies, each with their own distinct personality and comprehensive information. Garsha had become a double agent for Britain, of course, Britain didn't quite know this yet. But, in 1942, he approached British officials and was more formally acknowledged. In his greatest deception, Garsha told the Nazis that information they had about an invasion of Normandy was completely fake. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. When the war ended in 1945, he stuck around a little longer to make sure Germany had no further plans. After it was clear they didn't, he decided to move to South America to remove himself from memories of the war. But, concerned for his safety, he did what any normal person would do, faked his own death. He instructed his handler at Mi5 to tell everyone he had died from malaria and then moved to Venezuela, adopting a beard and some interesting glasses. He stayed there until 1980 until a British writer, Nigel West, theorized he hadn't actually died. And then, after almost 40 years, he returned to the nations he helped defend. Air Chief Marshal Sir Keith Park, a great person, if ever there was one. So forgotten by history, it's criminal. Sir Keith is one of very few single people one can argue saved the whole world. Also, he saved it from Hitler. Sir Keith was in the hottest of all hot seats, commander of Royal Air Force's No. 11 Group of Fighter Command, before and throughout the Battle of Britain. He was the first commander to defeat the Nazis in a major battle, one against all odds and most predictions, yet the world has largely forgotten him, which I find very unfortunate. So I copy and paste this answer kind of all the time, sorry about that. We've largely forgotten the equally magnificent Air Chief Marshal Lord Hu Dowding, Sir Keith's commander, and equally brilliant. We've also largely forgotten Air Vice Marshal Sir Quinton Brand, commander of the neighboring number 10 group. Really, we've forgotten a lot of Battle of Britain heroes who truly deserve to be remembered for what they did for us all. Anyway, here's Sir Keith, driving an awesome red sports car around Malta. The Battle of Britain lasted for about 5 months. Sir Keith was in command of number 11 group throughout. He and the pilots he led resoundingly defeated the Luftwaffe, day after day, until the Luftwaffe were so totally demoralized, depleted and exhausted having accomplished essentially nothing whatsoever, that they just gave up. What made that possible was Sir Keith's split-second tactical decisions. All of them. They were essentially flawless. Battle commenced in May 1940. It was Britain's backquote darkest hour, the British Empire at its weakest stood alone against Hitler's Reich at its peak. The four months that followed will forever remain backquote their finest hour, the few won. Sir Keith was a New Zealander, the leader of the few wasn't British, though he was a British national, as were all New Zealanders at the time. Particularly fitting, as one-sixth of fighter command's pilots were foreign nationals. These men were generally experienced fighter pilots, and their overall contribution to victory was enormous. Sir Keith served in WWI as an army and air officer, fighting for New Zealand, and later for Britain. He was awarded numerous medals for multiple acts of heroism and leadership. He served at Gallipoli and on the Somme. After being wounded on the ground, Sir Keith recovered and became a pilot. He became an ace WW1 fighter pilot, scoring 20 recorded victories. Sir Keith remained with the RAF between wars, rising to be Lord Dowding's best and most experienced fighter commander, as well as his friend. Lord Dowding was responsible for the implementation of the brilliant Dowding system, his foresight and planning in the years before the war, and his support of Sir Keith and others during the battle were absolutely crucial. The Battle of Britain. As World War II loomed, Lord Dowding entrusted Sir Keith with their defense of London and South East England. Number 11 Group's area was the most vital portion of the nation, and by far the most threatened by the Axis. Lord Dowding's faith in Sir Keith was rewarded. Dowding later said that Park was a magnificent group commander and that he couldn't have thought of anybody he would rather have had in preference to Park. 
before the battle, aerial combat doctrine was that the bomber will always get through. This led to an inherent tendency to intercept the enemy on their return flights using larger massed squadrons. Sir Keith upended that, much as Lord Nelson upended naval tactics at Trafalgar. Sir Keith's tactics were to attempt to intercept bombers rapidly, ideally before they reached their targets, using much smaller formations. That proved to be a near perfect choice. Essentially all daytime Luftwaffe bombing attempts were intercepted and harassed by RAF fighters. Because of this, those bombers couldn't hit their targets. His tactics also meant that fewer planes were left vulnerable on the ground at any one time, while refueling slash arming. So even if the Luftwaffe did manage to get a bomb on target, any losses were minimized. Others in the RAF, particularly 12 Group Commander Trafford Leigh Mallory, advocated for the opposite approach entirely. Their opposition was strenuous and continual, and became quite politicized. Many suggest that Lay Mallory resented Sir Keith's more prestigious posting. Thankfully, others supported Sir Keith's suggested tactics. Lord Dowding in particular went in to bat for Sir Keith and his tactics at the higher slash political level, while Sir Keith was busy winning the battle. Number 10 Group Sir Quinton Brand also strongly supported Sir Keith's tactics and Number 11 Group in general as well. And as a result of that team effort, the best tactics prevailed, and the battle was won. This map details Sir Keith's enormous responsibilities, edited for emphasis, from the original on Wikipedia. Sir Keith was responsible for protecting the purple area, while Lord Dowding was responsible for oversight of all the RAF fighter command groups. Sir Keith had 10 fighter aerodromes, hundreds of aircraft, and hundreds of pilots to command. He was responsible for the protection of South East England and London, meaning protection of much of Britain's vital war infrastructure, its leadership and commanders, and its people. Number 11 group were extremely close to the bulk of the enemy bombers and fighters. Almost all of his sector was within Luftwaffe fighter range. As such, they bore the brunt of the Luftwaffe bombing attempts, and faced the most Luftwaffe fighters. In spite of enormous pressures, Sir Keith was always a decent and thoughtful man, he enjoyed mutual respect and friendship with his crews. During the battle, he visited the airfields regularly in his personalized Hurricane Oklahoma 1, keeping spirits high, and ensuring the pilots were well cared for. In their own words, as reported by Stephen Bungay, the pilots all worshipped him. Had Sir Keith made mistakes during the battle the consequences could have been catastrophic. He didn't make any mistakes. Because of that, Sir Keith's group succeeded in defending Britain. Of the other groups, only 10 groups airfields were anywhere near as close to the Luftwaffe. AVM Sir Quinton Brand, a South African, and his group performed spectacularly too. They supported and protected Sir Keith and number 11 group whenever required. Like Sir Keith, Sir Quinton helped formulate and carry out Lord Dowding's plans and supported Dowding's. Parks and his own preferred tactics throughout the Battle 10 group also contended with ferocious battles in their own sector. Yet, Sir Quinton's burden was small compared to Sir Keith's. Nobody had ever beaten the Nazis. They were essentially undefeated after eight years of war fought across Europe. But then they had to fight Sir Keith. Sir Keith led the few to victory over Hitler's Reich every day. For nearly five months straight, the Battle of Britain was won. We celebrate the few. Their victory will never be matched. This was their finest hour, finest 2712 hours. But we don't celebrate the leader of the few as much as we probably ought to. Still don't believe me? Fine. Prime Minister Winston Churchill regularly visited number 11 group's command bunker at RAF Uxbridge. There, he would quietly watch Sir Keith and his team at work. Churchill made one such visit on 16 August 1940. As he left that evening, aides tried to speak to the Prime Minister. Inspired and overwhelmed, Churchill yelled. Don't talk to me. Never before have I been so moved. After a pause, he first said. Never in the history of mankind has so much been owed by so many to so few. Air Chief Marshal Sir Keith Park, GCB, KBE, MC and Bar, DFC, DCL, MA, RAF, 1892-1975. The Defender of London, Nazis gave him that title. If any one man won the Battle of Britain, he did. I don't believe it is recognized how much this one man, with his leadership, his calm judgment and his skill, 
did to save not only this country, but the world. RAF Head Lord Tedder, 1947. The awesome responsibility for this country's survival rested squarely on Keith Park's shoulders. RAF Ace Dalgas Bader. If it hadn't been for Park, we shouldn't be here today. I think that he was a magnificent group commander. I couldn't have thought of anybody I would rather have had in preference to Park, Lord Dowding. Links to audio of an interview with Lord Dowding. He was the only man who could have lost the war in a day or even an afternoon. RAF Ace Johnny Johnson. Adolf Hitler met his first defeat in eight years in what might go down in history as a battle as important as Waterloo or Gettysburg he played as important a role as the great Admiral Lord Nelson, who dominates Trafalgar Square, in securing the freedom that we enjoy today. Tony Benn and Lord Tebbit. A man without whom the history of the Battle of Britain could have been disastrously different. He was a man who never failed at any task he was given. Air Chief Marshal Sir Stephen Dalton. Sir Keith Park saved us, and the world, if it were down to me, we would name Hyde Park Keith Park, or Park Park. Then London Mayor Boris Johnson. Post-war Soviet interrogators asked were matched Commander Field Marshal von Rundstedt which battle he believed was most decisive. They expected him to say Stalingrad, but von Rundstedt replied the Battle of Britain. Winning the Battle of Britain was the turning point of the war. The few stopped Hitler's advance. Defeated, Hitler's focus turned to invading Russia. This split the Axis, and led to their devastation at the hands of the valiant Russians. The Battle of Britain victory amazed the United States of America. There, the RAF's ongoing successes were publicized with excitement and admiration. Before the battle, the US government didn't believe Britain could survive. Mid-battle, realizing Britain was winning, the USA began to substantially increase their material and moral support of the Allied war effort, eventually entering the war after Pearl Harbor. As an indirect consequence of Sir Keith's victory, both the USA and USSR entered the war as allies. Preventing Nazi invasion meant Britain could later provide the vital staging ground for the Allies' Western invasion of Nazi Europe. Siege of Malta. Sir Keith's feats include winning not one, but two vital aerial battles of the war. His command immediately turned the Siege of Malta in favor of the Allies. He took aerial command against what had been a two-year and five-month-long siege of relentless bombing. Within days, Sir Keith's new tactics forced the Luftwaffe to abandon daylight bombing of the island. Within months of his arrival, Sir Keith had once more defeated the Axis, they gave up trying to take Malta. Sir Keith's AHQ Malta then eviscerated Axis shipping supplies en route to Rommel's forces Africa. The damage they inflicted on Axis shipping contributed significantly to the Allied victory in Africa. Whereas in Britain he used small numbers of fighters against large enemy formations, in Malta he aggressively deployed large formations of fighters, one squadron after another, to attack comparatively smaller Luftwaffe and Italian formations. This too was an excellent tactical choice. Malta is much smaller, he had better visibility from improved radar technology and different weather, and he had plentiful spitfires to use. Recognition. Despite being one of the finest military leaders in history, Sir Keith's feats went almost unrecognized for decades. In recent years he's begun to receive some of the recognition he deserves. In 2009 a wonderful statue of Sir Keith was erected in London, Waterloo Place. Sir Keith in flight uniform stands guard, forever watching the skies toward continental Europe. The bronze plaque bestows his epic title. The Defender of London. It's a fine statue indeed. Though as Boris Johnson suggested, Sir Keith is worthy of far greater recognition than that. And that's why I think the greatest person we've largely forgotten about is Sir Keith. A WWII hero, from the far side of the globe, who stepped up, when it mattered most, and saved us all from Hitler. If you enjoyed this, please consider sharing this on Facebook, Twitter, and wherever else. Sir Keith's heroism deserves greater recognition. I vote for this guy. Sir Nicholas Winton, a British humanitarian and all-around legend, helped rescue hundreds of, mostly, Jewish children from Czechoslovakia on the eve of WW2. Initially coming to Prague to help a colleague, Martin Blake who worked for the British Committee for Refugees, Winton established an organization that arranged transport out of Czechoslovakia and into homes for the children in, mostly, Britain. He put out photos in magazines, 
seeking families who would accept them, and also wrote to politicians imploring that they lend a hand, although, of the other countries, only Sweden took in any children. In total, with help from several other collaborators, he saved 669 children from Nazi persecution 1. And the risk was very real. Sadly, the last group of 250 children were set to depart on the day Hitler invaded Poland, so the train never left. Only two survived the war. While Oskar Schindler is a household name for his humanitarian exploits, Winton doesn't have the same name recognition. For over 50 years, his achievements went unknown. Many news articles say he purposely suppressed his exploits, but this seems slightly embellished. He did mention them when he stood for a town council election. Regardless, his actions only came to light to the wider public in 1988, when Winton's wife discovered a scrapbook full of the details of the operation. She, in turn, gave the scrapbook to a Holocaust researcher, and 80 letters were sent to the, now grown, children whom Winton had saved. That same year, Winton was invited onto the BBC program That's Life, as a member of the audience. During the show, his scrapbook was shown, and his achievements explained. The host singled out a lady sitting next to Winton as one of the children he had saved. She then asked whether anyone in the audience owed their lives to Winton, and as grew it, you can see for yourself. Link in the description. Damn it, who's cutting onions in here? The Auschwitz volunteer, Witold Pilecki. This was a man who chose to go to hell on earth of his own free will. A modern sweepstake from Witold's report, a scene at Auschwitz. One time I saw a scene, which stuck in my memory for a long time. It was drizzling, and the day was gloomy. Near a pit, several SS men were standing, who could not depart in fear of the commander, who was walking throughout the camp. The SS men invented an entertainment for themselves. They bet something, each of them put a banknote on a brick. Then they buried a prisoner in sand, head down, and carefully covered him. Looking at their watches, they counted how many minutes he would move his legs. A modern sweepstake, I thought. Apparently, that one who was nearest the truth in his prediction for how long such a buried man would be able to move, before he was dead, swept the money. This was the sort of terror this man chose to live in for three years. In 1940, Witold came up with a plan Auschwitz concentration camp, to gather intelligence from the inside, and organize a resistance movement. It was completely voluntary, and he could easily have refused. Instead, he intentionally landed himself in the middle of a Gestapo sweep, and was picked up to go to Auschwitz. Until Pilecki went to Auschwitz, the world had no idea of the horrors taking place there. Witold's report, available online, exposed the barbarism at Auschwitz, so terrible, that it was dismissed as an exaggeration. Inmate number 4859 in Auschwitz, 1941, in Auschwitz, you had no names, you were just a number. Another excerpt from his report, we were driven forward, towards a larger group of concentrated lights. On the way one of us was ordered to run towards the polar side from the road and a machine gun burst was let off at him at once. Killed. Ten colleagues were pulled out of our ranks at random and shot down on the way with the use of machine guns, under joint and several responsibility for an escape, which was arranged by the SS men themselves. All the eleven people were being dragged on straps tied to one of the legs of each of them. Dogs were irritated by the bleeding corpses, and were set on them. All that was accompanied by laugh and scoffs. He didn't just survive. He organized an entire resistance movement. It was hard to even stay alive in the camps, let alone building a resistance network, organize escapes and send information outside, with the Gestapo always on the hunt for them. With almost a thousand men by 1942, and, barring for one incident with a Gestapo spy, not one of Pilecki's men betrayed each other, in extraordinary circumstances of starvation and violence. His very first message he sent out from the camp summed the situation, bomb Auschwitz. Even at the cost of killing everyone inside, himself included, it would be merciful. When it was clear there was no hope the Allies would act on his message, Witold escaped Auschwitz in 1943. In 1944, the Warsaw Uprising, with some of the fiercest fighting of the entire war, took place in Poland. It was forbidden for officers to join the fighting, but that didn't stop Pilecki. He simply hid his rank and joined the action. In fact, this wasn't even all. 
Before he turned 18, he'd fought in World War I and the Polish-Soviet War in 1919. Nor did he stop after World War II. Spurning the chance to live comfortably in the West, he returned to Poland to organize an intelligence network, this time against the Soviets, who'd occupied the country. Despite being told his identity had been leaked, Pilecki refused to leave. So what happened to such a man? This. He was tortured by the communist authorities, but refused to reveal the names of those he'd worked with. I cannot live. They killed me. Because compared to the Morshwitz was just a trifle. After a show trial, Witold Pilecki was executed in 1948 at the age of 47 with a bullet to the back of the head. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and to like this video. See you next time.